Welcome one to another edition of Play It Through an Honest Vision. It's Aladdin, Return of Jafar for the NES. This game is obviously an unlicensed game. It's a hack of Astyonix, which happens to be one of my favorite NES games of all time. Uh, just the absurdity that this exists is just amazing and awesome. It's not as lazy as a lot of unlicensed games where they just change the name and maybe change one or two sprites. They actually did the artwork or changed up the artwork for the cutscenes. Now, it's all in Japanese, so uh, unfortunately, you know, if you don't know Japanese, you won't be able to read. I don't know if they've changed up the storyline within this in order to make it more Aladdin related as opposed to being Astyonix. Uh, but I'm gonna leave all the cutscenes in during the gameplay just so you can see the changes as far as the artwork is concerned to the uh, various characters. After seeing the intro, we're then dropped to the title screen where we have Super Aladdin The Return of Jafar, or Aladdin Super The Return of Jafar, I'm not sure either way it's said. Once you press start though, you get another cutscene before we get to the first level. Outside of the cutscenes and Aladdin sprite in the game, that's what's been changed here. The level designs and the order of the levels and everything like that haven't been changed. I love the fact that they actually put a genie sprite, and it's Cutie, the fairy from, of course, Astyonix, being the genie here, which leads to some weird things because of the ending of this game. If you've ever played Astyonix before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Armed with now his axe, Aladdin sets forth into Remlia in order to try to save Jasmine from Jafar. The game, of course, plays the same. Astyonix is an action platformer that had some beautiful artwork for the NES and had some great music also that goes along with the game. It's something that I've always loved about Astyonix was not only its look, its storyline, and the music. It suffers from some technical issues. This ROM hack is no exception where it's, you know, slowing down consistently due to the amount of stuff that's going on on screen. Now, there's a few things going on in the game that are interesting as far as mechanics are concerned. You do have three different weapons. You're able to upgrade your sword and it will do more damage. The thing is, by upgrading your sword, it changes the amount that it costs in order to use magic in the game, and magic is very useful to help you get through areas easier and defeat bosses more quickly. We make it to the end of the first area here in Remlia, and I'm going to hit the boss a couple of times before spamming some spells in order to take care of him. 
Then we get to the big boss for Remley here, this guy riding a dragon creature thing. I'm going to hit him a couple of times and then use my magic in order to get rid of the dragon. And then as soon as he's gone, he's then going to just attack you on his feet. And I'm going to nail him just a couple of times after using a spell and that'll take care of him. Pretty easy fight. Obviously a lot more difficult if you don't know the exact timing with the attacks. The other big thing you'll notice, of course, with the gameplay is the fact that you have that power meter that you're able to fill up, and if you attack, of course, with it filled, you do more damage to the enemy. So it's better to wait a few moments to attack instead of just spamming the attack button, which is something I always thought was a cool little idea. After the next cutscene plays out, we're now dropped into the second level of the game. Every level that you go through from here on out has two parts. A 2-1 and a 2-2, or 3-1, 3-2, that kind of thing. There is some weird glitching in this particular unlicensed game that I run into when I go to any of the levels that you either have to go top to bottom or bottom to top, basically scrolling up vertically instead of horizontally like most levels. It just completely glitches out. I know the game extremely well, in fact I could probably beat some of the levels in the game blindfolded almost, so I'm easily able to still get through this, but that's not how the game's intended as you'll see when we make it to the uh, next level after this. Enemies can respawn a lot, and with the skeleton guys, another one won't spawn if there's still one on screen, which you can actually use to your advantage to help you out a little bit if you get one chasing you, but unfortunately it will end up slowing down the game a lot. For uh, this little guy here, he will actually come up and try to like swipe at you as he's moving across the ground every time you deliver a hit. And if you time it right, you can kind of stun lock him and keep being able to deliver damage to him over and over again without him being able to actually attack you. Here we go with an example of the entire graphics going to heck. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. One thing I love, though, is one of the graphics for the ledges is used for the power meter as, it, as you're, I'm going up. If I attack, that, like, white bar that's above and below me right now as I'm going up will actually decrease. And the same goes uh, for the other little symbols that they're using as jumbled mess uh, represents my health. A very easy, straightforward level as you're just working your way up, and the same goes for pretty much all the levels like this. There's no, like, pits or anything that you have to worry about during these levels, and you're not going to get crushed or anything. If you fall down to a previous ledge, you're perfectly okay. So, even with the jumbled mess of graphics, it's still a pretty easy level to get through. After taking out this gargoyle guy at the top, we're going to face off with the Medusa-like character, and this is a pain in the butt boss because uh, the hit detection isn't uh, the greatest like you have a really large hit window uh, that you're able to get hit and even more so it's a pain in this particular version uh, because Astyonix's sprite normally is much larger uh, so that's of course not changed here so you have a lot of blank area that you can still get hit here as as Aladdin I, I, I'm watching this footage and talking about it, and I'm still laughing at just the fact that this exists. I found this a long time ago, and I've been wanting to do a play it through for it for a while, so I'm glad I'm finally able to do that.
a little bit of a shorter cutscene before we drop into level three here, another one of the horizontal scrolling levels here. Start off with this uh, skeleton that I'll be able to take out. And this is pretty much the last levels in the game that I really won't be using the time stop mechanic, which is actually a really cool ability that you're able to use in order to freeze time and allow you to get through areas a lot easier. The infamous marshy stage from Astyonix 4-1 uh, is a breeze if you use the time manipulation. During this level, I try to hold on to as much of my magic as I can because the boss at the end of the segment is a bit of a pain because you'll see when you attack him, it's a bull that charges up an electricity spell and then sends it towards you. But as you're attacking him, since he doesn't really move all that much, you can actually knock him off screen. And if you knock him off screen, he spawns back on the opposite side of the screen. So if you hit him too far over here to the right, and you can just keep attacking him and he won't be able to get his move off because he has to keep recharging. Uh, but if you knock him too far over to the right, he'll come out the left side, and usually getting an attack off, but also the fact you have to travel all the way across, and you don't move particularly fast, so a bit of an annoying boss. Level 3-2, named Rent. Nothing to do with the musical, obviously, but here we're just heading downwards. There's a few enemies, the weird slime guys that we saw in the other level that we were going up. I know I was going through it fast, and it's a mess, but basically same guys here. They kind of dance, they shake back and forth, they throw spears, but they're pretty easy to actually jump over them. If the ceiling and platforms weren't so close together, it would be very easy just to avoid all the enemies, because you just quickly walk over them and just then do a jump and be able to easily pass them with your jumps. And you have a pretty high jump in the game, but the platforms just don't allow you to do such things. Uh, this is also a level where you want to try to conserve your health if possible. The mini-boss at the end is a bit of a pain, but the actual boss right after him is much worse, and one of the trickier bosses, especially if you're trying to, like, bulldoze your way through. That little item holder there on the far right, which you would have to do a little bit of platforming to get to, is a full health replenishment every time, so keep that in mind if you're playing Astyonix, or even if you decide to check out this unlicensed <laughs> mess of a game, uh, you can grab that and then drop down and take on this guy and be able to easily deal with him. Once he's done, though, and watching out for as many of his rocks as possible, we face this weird thing. I don't even know how to describe what this weird creature is. Uh, and then as you're fighting him, and he's moving back and forth very slowly in his, like, giant mech-like suit, he'll then lose his face or lose his mask, maybe? And you get to see, like, this really, like, it's like skin. Like, his skin's been ripped off. It's just exposed. Like, all muscly and all. I don't know. That's how I've always looked at it. I'm probably wrong. And then he ends up escaping and then starts pulsating and flying around. And it looks like a decrepit, deformed, gory beaver. I, I don't even know what. But he flies back and forth and he drops bubbles that move sporadically when they're falling, like in a wave pattern, which can be really difficult to dodge. As you damage him more, he gets faster and faster, making it really difficult to avoid him and the bubbles and be able to get in hit since he'll be moving much faster than you and getting your attacks off can be a little bit slow. So try to conserve your health and conserve your magic if all possible when dealing with that boss. So here we go with the infamous marshy stage. Very similar to like Castlevania 1 when you make it to the swamp level and it's a very difficult stage. It's the same principle here. You can get knocked back easily uh, into the, all the various pits and there's a lot of enemies. You have these fishmen that pop out of the water constantly. The thing is though, if you use the time stop ability, which you can pause and you have three spells, the only two I'm going to be using though are the fire based spell and then the time stop spell. 
Uh, you can use this at any point, though, to freeze the enemies and then keep going. The thing is, though, you won't have a lot of the usage if you've upgraded your weapon to the max version. So that's why in the game I keep the second weapon up until the very, very end, and then in the final boss battle I switch over to the best weapon in the game because at that point it ends up really helping during the final boss. But outside of that, you want to make sure that you keep the second level sword. And I accidentally almost, almost grabbed the, uh, the other upgrade, which would have been pretty much a game killer. I would just stop the game and restart it at that point. The thing is, also, randomly throughout the levels, you can run into Cutie, in this case, the Genie, and you have two options, and one of the options is to replenish all of your magic, which is very useful here in Marshy, so we can use the time stop again, but then get to the boss at the end of Skeleton, which is just a regular skeleton we fought before, but he has a wave move he's able to do as he attacks, and he has a ton of health. So I hit him a couple of times and then just spam the rest of my magic that I have, and I end up killing him off screen. But thankfully, that takes care of that, and we're moving on to 4-2. 4-2 is grave, and uh, I guess appropriately enough, it's kind of a mausoleum-type setup here, catacombs. It's kind of a really cool setting. Like I said, I love the backgrounds and the graphics and astyonics. This is another level where using the time stop efficiently will be very useful for helping. You can't spam it too much because you'll end up running out way before. This is a pretty lengthy level. In fact, it may be the longest of the horizontal scrolling levels in Astyonix. I never really officially like measured exactly how many steps every level is, but I think this one's probably the longest one. There's a good example of when you take out one skeleton, the other one doesn't spawn until the other one's gone. So you saw when that one dropped in a the pit, then immediately the other one spawns. So you want to try to manipulate it so you get past spawn points if one's chasing you. I also wait until a whole lot of enemies have gathered and the game is going to an absolute crawl before I decide to use my time stop sometimes. That way I get the most out of it. I can kind of get away from as many enemies as possible. A few enemies uh, throughout this level, and in general, uh, the ones that are on like platforms, like the little flower plant things, as well as whatever those things are supposed to be, that orange thing there, uh, you can attack them from other platforms. And you have a pretty good reach with your weapon, which is definitely recommended before attempting to jump over them. Get this skeleton to chase me for a little bit. He'll end up, thankfully, dropping down a pit as I reach the end of the level. This is a pretty annoying boss here, this mini boss, and we have another boss right after it, but I'm going to use for the most part my magic on this one uh, instead of using it on the boss, which hit or miss mistake here because he's just a little bit of a pain because he's teleporting a lot, and uh, the boss here for this level is this weird tree god like thing, and he fires out little plants that grow and then explode. He has like a vine thing that he spews out of his mouth that grows and ends up running into. Really cool design overall for the creature. Uh, but he's a lot easier to deal with than deformed gory beaver thing from the previous world. So uh, I usually just charge up my attacks and I have a good amount of health since we got a full health right before the mini boss or whatever, mid boss, whatever that thing is supposed to be. So, I just charge up my attacks and keep doing jumps and avoid as much of the damage as I can. Thankfully, he doesn't damage you a whole lot, and he goes down and we're moving on to round five.
Next level is another one that has a really cool design. It's a giant bridge, basically, as we're heading towards the castle where Jasmine, in this case, is being held. Uh, another level, though, that we will definitely be using the Time Stop ability. You don't have to be as frugal with it in this stage. It's not quite as long as Grave. Uh, it's still a relatively lengthy stage, though, so you don't want to overuse it too much. Use it when it's going to be most useful uh, to help you out here, but still going to not uh, wait as long to use it sometimes. You also can get a magic replenishment uh, at the end of the stage. So you can use that right before the boss and be able to easily take it out. It's actually one of the really cool bosses. Another really cool boss. I know most of them are pretty cool, at least in my eyes. Uh, but still, one of the, my favorites in, in the game for sure. Here we're able to get a full health replenishment. That ends up helping as I've taken an okay amount of damage so far, but thankfully if I'm able to get that magic replenishment near the end, I, I won't really be in too dire of straits. Here I'm going to use the last time stop that I have, but there is where Genie, Cutie sprite still not changed from like the actual in-game thing when you find her, and then it goes the genie though in this cutscene, which is I like I said before, it's just brilliant. The boss here starts off as a eagle or bird and a lion, and as you damage it, it then forms into one, which I always thought was a really cool mechanic, and then starts flying around, and you can just kind of spam the magic that we've now gotten in order to finish it off. 5-2 is another one of the levels where we're going to be going vertically, and uh, that's going to be a mess of graphics. The thing is, though, 5-2 doesn't have a boss after the mid-boss. So, hold on to your magic, and then when you make it to the top, you can easily just spam the magic you have and beat the level easily. So it makes the level really easy. And one of the reasons why we end up having this, though, is this is the second to last world. And 6-1 and 6-2 both have bosses at the end of it, so that's the reason why it kind of ends up equaling out uh, as far as, like, the big bosses. At the top here, we meet this guy. This is the same guy we fought right before the deformed beaver. He kind of, like, flexes and throws rocks. We'll see him again because you have a boss rush uh, in the final level of the game. But we're just going to spam the magic and take him out, and now we're on to the last world of the game. Now this level is one of those dreaded maze-like stages. Thankfully though, it's a very, very easy maze to get through. As you're traveling, you have these gates in the background that you have to hold up in order to teleport through. Any of them will lead you end up back to the beginning unless there's a skeleton that spawns where you're at the right one. So that's the giveaway that you know you're at the right teleporter is when a skeleton ends up spawning right at that. So. You see the skeleton, then you're able to go through whichever one that is and go to the next area. It can be annoying sometimes because you're fighting so many enemies and you have to hold up for like a couple of seconds before it ends up being recognized. So usually I just try to knock the skeleton out of the way and then hold up immediately so I can try to get through uh, as quickly and easily as possible. You don't have to be super conservative with your health during the level because there is full health replenishment right before the boss. So that ends up really helping you. And we're going to use kind of suicide strats on the boss of the level because of this. You'll also notice that the colors are changing and doing the different colors for each area. And that's another sign that you've, of course, chosen the uh, correct path. Thank you. 
After going through this gate, we're now in a completely different looking area, and this is where the boss is located. You'll have a couple of item things, you can grab that one, and then there's one at the right here, this is a full health replenishment, so make sure that you end up grabbing that if you want to have full health. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use my magic abilities on this boss, and that will make, of course, the next boss a little bit more difficult in order to deal with, but I have a little bit left. After a cutscene, we then get dropped into the boss encounter, which is just a, once again, weird design, cool design. And like I said, I'm going to use kind of suicide strats here. Go through him and attack him from the other side. This way I just avoid his projectiles and his laser. I'm taking a lot of damage from his body, but it only does one heart of damage. So because of this, you get plenty of opportunity to wait, charge up shots, and be able to attack him. So. Even though we don't have a lot of magic at our disposal during this fight, uh, it's still very easy to uh, be able to take him out. It's now time for the final level of the game, the tower, and this is another one of those levels where you're going up, so the graphics are completely destroyed here. Uh, so what we're going to do is you have to take on each of the bosses, the mid-bosses or whatever, well, most of them, they're not all included in this. Uh, the first one and the first few we're going to just attack normally, not using our magic. You can use your magic during this as you'll get full magic back when you make it to the boss at the top of the tower. If this guy fires out a ton of projectiles, he can end up slowing the game down a bit, so a bit of an annoyance. After taking out that guy, you'll head up and face off with the slimy dude from the uh, second level of the game. And like I said before, you can kind of stun lock him a little bit. If you time it perfectly, you can stun lock him, but that can be difficult because of the timing. The do it is very, very precise because if you're just off by a frame or two, he'll end up being able to come over and attack you. Now we face off with that bull again. Gonna get up close to him and try to attack him, stop him from attacking a 
at least a lot. I can take a little bit of damage. Like I said, you're going to get full health and magic back when you make it to the top of the tower to face off with the uh, boss. So you don't have to be too stingy. You just got to make sure you survive uh, through this whole aspect. Once he gets weak, weakened enough, then I'll use a magic attack to kind of finish him off, especially when he's now back on the opposite side. So just to avoid taking damage, I'll use one of my magic spells there. We then face off with the flexing golem kind of guy again. Gonna try to avoid the rocks he's throwing out, kind of backing away as I do this and charging up my attack as much power as I can in order to deliver a couple of hits to him. Once he gets weakened enough, you can use your magic, and that way you'll still have a magic spell or two on the next boss, which is that uh, eagle and lion, or bird and lion again. I'm going to attack the lion just a couple of times, and then use my magic, and one last hit, and he's taken care of, and now we're at the top of the tower. When you get up here, you'll have a couple of item things, and we'll be able to uh, get our health fully back, as well as even though we don't grab something that gives us our magic back, after the cutscene, before the boss battle begins, you end up having full magic, so... Now, as the battle begins, this guy kind of disappears and reappears, and he charges up a magic spell before he ends up using it. He can also attack you straight up with his sword. Now, on the far left side of this battle, which wasn't there when we came up here the first time, but ends up appearing during this fight, is another item thing which has a weapon upgrade in it. So now, when we've made it to this point, we're now going to get that final weapon upgrade, and we'll be doing a lot more damage, and this will allow us to finish off this guy, and then do a pretty good amount of damage to the next boss, the actual final boss of the game, which is this dragon that you have to attack the item in his chest that kind of pulsates. It disappears after a few seconds, though, so you don't have a ton of time in order to attack it. With fully charged up powerful shots, though, you're able to do a lot of damage, and as you're damaging it, he'll change color. The thing is, you want to try to keep some of your magic if possible, and then use the two spells that we get with the final weapon upgrade, weaken him down to the red form. Once he's red, he does a time stop ability, which is devastating, and you'll end up dying after just a few turns because it's really hard to get away from him as he spams the fire and all. So, when we finally get him to turn red, we've hit him a couple of times, use our last two magic spells, finish him off, and enjoy the ending to Asionix, or... Aladdin, Return of Jafar.
So there you have Aladdin, Return of the Jafar, or Astyonix. So in the ending, why it's kind of weird uh, is if you've ever played Astyonix, uh, Cutie, the fairy who helps you all throughout, ends up sacrificing herself right before the final level of the game. And for her bravery, once the princess is saved, she ends up bringing Cutie back to life and turns her into a full-blown human and sends her to the real world to be with Astyonix. And obviously, that's creepy or weird in this version because Cutie was the genie. So Genie has been transformed into a human and changed into a woman and now is with Aladdin in the real world that's not Agrabah or whatever. I don't know. It's difficult to explain, but it ends up being hilarious because of what it is. But uh, anyway, guys, that's going to wrap up this episode of Play It Through. Thank you so much for watching, and of course, I hope you enjoyed.